welcome everyone. Welcome any viewers who might be here. Uh, this is the speculative biology panel. All right. Um, and so I, so my, I'll start by saying my goal for this panel discussion is for our audience to leave inspired to imitate nature and thus uh, honor it. So that's my goal. And uh, I'm, and we all have our own agendas, though, so uh, you'll get a bit of everything. Because um, it sounds like so it. sinister, Dan. We all have our own agendas. As, as, <laughs> as, as does as nature. Uh, <laughs> agents of any ecosystem, we all want our own things. Um, so I'm going to start by asking uh, my panelists to introduce themselves. Um, uh, Casey, can you can you start? What's uh, what's your deal? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so kia ora everyone and good morning. Uh, my name is Casey Lucas. I am an author based down in Wellington, New Zealand, though as you can probably tell by my accent, that is not where I originally hail from. Uh, at the moment, I am working primarily in short fiction and localizing manga for the English market. So I work for Seven Seas, working on graphic novels and that sort of thing. And then when I am not tinkering in the speculative writing field, I work on the transit simulators, mini metro and mini motorways for my day job. So trains. I remember no that. Trains. I that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, how about Adrian? Uh, Hi, I'm next. OK, I'm a, a UK based writer of fantasy and science fiction. I'm probably best known for my book. Uh, Children of Time, which was my first venture into serious sci-fi as opposed to the uh, fantasy end of things. Uh, my most sort of spec bio, spec evolution uh, book has most definitely been uh, Dolls of Eden, uh, in which I have about 15 different evolutionary histories of Earth all kind of jostling up together. So uh, if, if, you want, if you want my writing and you want uh, this particular topic, that's the one to go for. Of Eden. I, I enjoyed it a great deal. Um, and uh, how about how about Julie? Hi, I'm delighted to be here. My name is uh, Julie Chineda. For those who wondered how to say that, I'm based in uh, Ottawa, Canada, and it's uh, a lovely it's thunderstormy afternoon, so it's not too bad to be here. My background and my passion is in biology. My science fiction has always been and continues to be based in biology. So speculating is my my gem. So I'm very happy to be here and, and just be with such a, a wonderful panel. Thanks all for being here. And to see Peter, who is a dear friend who I haven't seen in such a long time. And we might never see each other again. I mean, the way things are going now. <laughs> Maybe we'll meet each other fighting over the last tin of spam in the aftermath. I was office. not that far away. <laughs> Segway, Peter. I'm um, I'm Peter Watts. I actually used to be a biologist in the past century, um, and in a sort of a uh, an ongoing chronic fit of insecurity since I had become a science fiction writer, I I sort of desperately try to stack actual scientific references to the backs of my novels in an attempt to to um, appease those in academia who who think that writing science fiction makes me one step above a child molester. Um, but for all that, for whatever craven reason I do that, it does seem to have some kind of an impact. People do actually seem to read the, uh, um, read the references, um, maybe to get away from actually reading the text of the novel, I don't know. Um, and, and I suppose my writing is, also, for obvious reasons, profoundly biological, profoundly ecological, sort of, uh, I, I tend to go in for a lot of neuro stuff. Um, I'm hoping that's a wide enough field that, that I'm not actually in a rut. Um, but if I am in a rut, I've been in one for 20 years um, and I'm still paying the bills. So, so like maybe I'm the rush of Canadian science fiction. I like can only do three things, but I do them really well. And um, and I'm Daniel Benson. Uh, I, I write under the name Daniel M. Benson. Uh, and my first book was out two years ago. It's called Junction. And uh, then I had a, a comic book 
Um, and uh, I write, I write uh, speculative biology, trying to do what you guys are doing. So uh, this is this is my chance to ask some of the questions that I always want to know. Uh, so I'm very honored to be here, and thank you all for joining me. Um, all right, so there's a chat in uh, WebEx, but I don't actually see anyone using it. Instead, I see people using the uh, Discord thing, which doesn't fit on my screen. So, unfortunately, I'm going to ignore your questions, audience, until we're at about the 20 minute mark, and then I'll, I'll switch over to you entirely. Um, but first, I have some questions of my own. And, and I see the rest of you guys peering at your screens. So, uh, if you see a really good question, you can ask it of yourself. Go ahead. Um, okay, but this is my first question. So, uh, let's say you read a description of an organism and you don't know whether this is a real or a speculative organism. Uh, you're not told, but you read its description, maybe you have a picture. What would tip you off that you were looking at something that wasn't real? Where I read it. <laughs> well, then you read it. <laughs> well, you know, Sorry, you just kind of threw that. And got, if I read it in a science fiction novel, I would be inclined to already be going there. But if I read it in a novel, I would be inclined to be a little less peer reviewed. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's like, I, if, I, if, I close, if I close the book and there's like a sexy green skinned lady on the cover, I'm just assuming <laughs> that. But maybe, maybe, you know, I mean, I've got, I've got tentacles on the covers and then I've got lots of real biology in mind. So All right. uh, I'm not sure All I'm right. answering your question, Dan, Dan, but that's sort of the first thing that occurred to me was to, to look at the source of the information first, because there's not that many things that surprise us. There's just obscure things that we might not know, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be, it would be unlikely. I, I mean, say that, um, I, I'll go ahead. No, no, you go, you go. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, if I am reading and I encounter a description of a creature that I have never heard of before, and um, if I'm like looking at social media and I see a picture of an animal that I've never seen before, I just want to say that like being in your 30s and still coming across a new animal is like the purest joy. It's just like this yeah. straight hit of dopamine. It's like the nicest feeling that I can ever experience. So um, if if you ever manage to put something like that in front of me, um, I just want to say thank you. But um, yeah, that that's a really tough question. Um, Adrian, did you did you have a good yeah, one I, for that? Because I don't. <laughs> well, weirdly enough, I think it's all you. I almost feel the the stranger it is, the more likely it is to be real because fictional creatures tend to conform to narrative expectations. Um, I mean, I'm thinking things like the alien from Alien here, or, or, or all that vast raft of fictional creatures who go out above and beyond any reasonable energy budgeting or desire because they must eat the protagonist, no matter what biology they use, or no matter whether he <laughs> would poison them to death instantly, they will they will charge over an entire planet to hunt down that one spaceman or woman that is that is the focus of the narrative. And they they tend to be the the more kind of narratively convenient in that sense the description is in the sense of well this is a thing that's obviously designed to be as scary as possible to humans and to be terribly dangerous to us in a lot of utterly over the top ways it, the more it goes on that the more likely it is to be fictional I might want to raise a just a moment a, a note of, of caution in the sense that that uh, uh, stuff that shows up in the peer-reviewed literature is not necessarily something that can be taken uh, as gospel either. Uh, there was a paper that came out in the peer-reviewed literature a while back claiming that cephalopods had um, come from outer space. Oh, God, yes. And uh, and it was kind of, you know, it was, it was not treated kindly. Um, there's a, a recent TV series uh, called Resident Alien, starring Alan Tudyk, which actually has taken that that premise and run with it. The alien actually evolved from cephalopods, and they actually had a great little montage of the octopuses crashing down in the. In the restaurant. It was, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's but but there is and there are also speculative um, uh, 
papers that came out in in peer reviewed literature, highly, you know, admittedly speculative stuff, but but. Um, to to Adrian's point about energy conservation, there's a whole school of thought that says that the solution to Fermi's paradox is that basically all the intelligent aliens out there have sealed themselves up in in super Tupperware and have gone into a period of dormancy until such a time as the universe has aged to the point where computation becomes less energetically uh, intensive. Apparently, there's too much sort of noise, noise and decoherence in the thermal environment, the cosmic environment at this point. And they're basically waiting for the, the pot to simmer down um, before <laughs> basically all the old ones uh, emerge from, from their Tupperware and presumably at that point duke it out with all the energy they've saved. Um, yeah. It's I, getting, I mean, there was some game of World of Warcraft. Yeah, there, there's some, the, the thing is, there's some, uh, I, I agree with Adrian, there are some, there's some absolutely batshit stuff out there that has been speculated about that we have not discovered, but which actually does kind of hang together. Mm -hmm. And then there's other stuff that's getting published in the peer reviewed uh, literature that's just batshit insane. Um, and I will, I will, con I will admit that I got taken in in 1991 by an article in new scientist about this new subspecies of Antarctic penguin they had discovered that actually had a highly vascularized plate on its head and it used it to melt through the ice and create undersea yeah. tunnels. Those things. Uh, it, it, was, it was an April Fool's article. <laughs> but, and, and they and, like and mole rats, yes, yes. In my, in my defense, I was coming through a very painful breakup at the time and perhaps my critical <laughs> faculties were not all they could have been, but yeah, I, you were I, just actually... looking for something to hold on to, <laughs> yeah. and a penguin that could melt ice with its head was what you needed at that time. <laughs> if, it, if it could melt ice, it perhaps could have it could have melted my stony cold heart. <laughs> actually, um, what you what you and Adrian brought up gives me a really good kind of barometer that I personally use now that I think about it when I'm reading fiction. If I'm thinking does this animal seem like it sucks, basically, um, from a design mm -hmm. perspective? Uh, I, I don't know how crass I'm allowed to be on here. Um, it's kind of a dodgy sentence to ask and open with, I guess. But, um, <laughs> I don't you know, know. You, you're talking so much about, you know, like uh, char uh, characters that are designed to flee this creature that is designed to eat them, and it must exist doing what it's doing for plot purposes. And so I guess if I was looking at a fictional design for a creature, I would say, like, what's going on with the boring bits that we don't need to know about? Did you give it a butthole, so to speak? You know, yeah. like, did you design the bits that aren't relevant to killing the protagonist? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of flatulence in my, in my work. Yeah. 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 It's, it's got to be. It's got to be. <laughs> but there's a difference between what people are trying to fool you into, into reading and what it is that makes a character like a, a, a construct of biology convincing to you as a as a reader or a watcher or a game player and to make them convincing i think we're touching on all of that not to be the stereotype give it a butthole and, and actually make it so convincing it doesn't even matter if it really exists on earth and maybe you don't want it to but for the story it works there's also there's something about Yes. Sorry, uh, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, that was, was Peter. Just, sorry. Um, Jesus, what was I going to say? Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, there's also an element you've got to take into account that frequently real life doesn't make sense. Um, not just in the sense that it's, it's wild and out there, but in the sense that it doesn't seem to be very well designed. We were not, you know, we were not intelligently engineered. We were sort of cobbled together by a series of haphazard and blind processes that really doesn't care whether you're optimal um, or even whether you have a butthole. All it cares is whether what you have in place of a butthole is better than the competition's butthole. <laughs> and for that reason, what we have- for, Very arms race. <laughs> we, have, we, have eye, we have eyes in which all the cabling lies in front of the visual sensor. We have giant blind spots in the middle of our of our visual fields where the cabling goes in um, through the retina and back up to the optic nerve that we do not see. We go blind four to seven times a second 
as our eyes jiggle around. Um, and these are these are things these are things that kind of work for us and and for various reasons you know the competition hasn't done better but perhaps if i was going to look for evidence that something had not was not a legitimate life form if i was reading a, an article or or um peer reviewed literature or whatever i would perhaps look for suboptimality in those sorts of things, I would I would look for things that were kind of half-assed. Pythons, for example, reticulated pythons use constipation as a predator strategy. They basically load their butt ends up with so much shit that it acts as an anchor, and then they can hurl their front ends towards prey. And perhaps some competitor in in days gone by actually tried to do the same thing but by developing muscle mass or fat mass sort of at the back end but that takes metabolic energy to maintain it's much cheaper to just have a <laughs> giant rectum and a very tiny i don't know why we keep coming back to buttholes casey started but, it <laughs> it's more your problem than mine at this point here this is so basically they use they use shit as an anchor for for uh lunge attacks um Look for batshit insane things, and look for things that that work well enough, but don't, but, but that aren't optimized. If everything you see about your creature is optimized, it's either made up, or it was designed and engineered by something else, right. which is another way of saying it's made up. Except you took you took it from imagination to a three D printer somewhere. Hmm. Neat, I like that. All right. Do you want to say something, Julie? No, I was just complimenting Peter. I was just remembering how fun it is to be on a panel with you. <laughs> Wait, you. I like how Casey was like, how crass can we be? Can we mention the bubble? And she had no idea. And the Canadians were so nice. The, 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 how crass was, was it going to be is that I was, I was thinking what term for butthole is okay to say. <laughs> we, we, we very quickly uh, find what. Okay. All right. So this is, this is a new question. And I'll, I'll ask Julie. I'll ask Julie first. Oh, um, okay. What's your process for creature creation? I tend to go from function if it's uh, something that's going to be a background, like part of the ecology that's that's there. Uh, I'm looking for where it fits in the ecosystem, or or in the civilization that I'm having. If it's something that's uh, intelligent and it's moving around, so I use my mother's vacuum cleaner once. Uh, and stuck flowers on it and, and worked my way backwards from there to make a janitor species that would be something that would hang out in ships and, and would really focus on the minutia. I mean, they worship water treatment plants. I kept going. And so it, for me, it was function and what would make that function work. And then, uh, you know, they, they'd go hang out and expel, you know, various gases and clouds out, outside ships to, to make pretty things. It, it, it just snowballed from there. But I, I started with a function or or a particular scent if I'm look sense if I'm looking into communication, like what would a UV uh, light sensing be used for navigation and how where would that be on the body and I work backwards from there and they add bits so I sort of build, cobble things together. Uh, where does the janitor species uh, come from? Which book can our viewers? Oh, know? it's in the Clan Chronicles. Um, I have my wonderful starships. Oh no, it's, pardon me, no, the Essen books. There, there were there were in that one. The Web Shifter books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody else? Should I should I randomly select Casey? What's your sure. process? Sure. <laughs> um, when I am designing, uh, so from I, th I think it probably comes from my background working in video games. Um, when I am designing critters, I tend to start with uh, environment first, because to me, if the creatures that I am coming up with don't make sense contextually with all of each other, I won't be able to really envision it all and play around with it and feel like I'm properly having a good time with it until it seems to me like it might be at least a reasonable facsimile of a simulation of an ecosystem, even if it's just the broad strokes, just because um, I guess that's that's just the way your brain works when you work on train simulators for a living. That's just how it happens. <laughs> it's the order in which thoughts come. 
But um, for my current project, uh, I, I wrote a long running web serial for several years that has been picked up by an international agency um, to get shopped uh, into a traditionally published novel now. So, yay for one. But um, it's all forest and fungus based. And so I was uh, very much inspired by the deserts where I grew up, which have a lot of uh, clonal aspen colonies. And um, I'll pop a link into Discord here. If you're not familiar with uh, clonal colonies of aspens uh, that pop up in the Western, uh, probably elsewhere in the world, but in the Western US in the deserts, um, they're basically forests that are just a single living organism that are all basically uh, clones of the same root system. And you see them and they appear to be separate trees. And um, I'm not going to just quote the whole Wikipedia art article at you. You can read it yourself. <laughs> there you go. But um, essentially, I wanted to take that and think, um, so this, this is a secondary world fantasy. It's as far from the crunchy sci-fi end of the spectrum as you can get because um, there's only so much crunchy simulation I can fit into my brain, and I want my writing to be more whimsical than the train games, basically. Uh, but uh, I just thought, what if you were in a situation where there were multiple organisms uh, in, an, in an environment like this that had some sort of event that caused them to grow and evolve uh, quickly? What would something be like if it went through several generations of iteration um, without the necessary time involved that necessarily are that uh, in the real world uh, is uh, necessary for that evolution. And um, yeah, it's it's still a, very much a work in progress. But um, yeah, I just tend to think about uh, what what happens in the real world and um, how do interesting organisms interact with each other already. And then what's just one one change I can make and then go from there. Nice, nice. I like that. Should I move on to another question, or or Peter and Adrian, do you want to talk about your process? Um, I guess I'd, I I can say a very quick note. I I've got two processes because a lot of the writing I've done has been based on um, exist evolving existing Earth forms, and that's obviously a very different kind of um, idea to taking something genuinely alien because you've already got a momentum and trajectory. And all you need, what you need to consider then is, well, what is the new, what are the new environment and challenge facing this thing, and where that will change it into something. And I mean, the, you know, Doors of Eden is all about taking existing sort of um, mostly extinct creatures and thinking, well, if they, if they had, if they, what is the path between what we know they were and let's, you know, and a, and a sort of fully sentient civilization of these things and, and what what's pressures might bring them there and that so the idea of thinking about what it is that is shaping the the, the kind of the effectively the unintelligent processes that are evolution that would take something from you know, a uh, a trilobite to say is my my favorite my favorite example to a thing which is immortal and spacefaring um because that was fun and i kind of worked out a framework that that <laughs> yeah. might conceivably have gone down given it had basically half a billion years to do it peter's drooling <laughs> I, I just like that approach um no, it's, it's not my approach. also also i'm old so i, I drool that's basically <laughs> why i grew the goatee in the first place um <laughs> don't laugh after uh after civilization collapses, there's going to be a shortage of potable water, and this acts as a very good sponge. It's almost Fremen in terms of its water retention capabilities. <laughs> anyway, the uh, I, I kind of go at it the other way around. I don't start by designing a creature. I start with an idea that I want to explore, and then say, what can I build that illustrates or explores this idea? Um, unfortunately, I also tend to do that with my characters, as, as many people have noticed. Um, but in terms of designing a creature, I read a, a paper, oh, oh, must have been 10 years ago now, basically arguing that what we are is life 2.0. And life 1.0 was, wait for it, cancer. And that the things that we are kind of looking at now as cancer are actually the sort of the vestigial remains of an alpha build. 
And they, they brought up a bunch of, of arguments about, you know, cancer just not being a proliferation of cells. It develops its own circulatory system to feed the cells. It does various things. And once again, this was like one of those, those papers that came out, made a splash, and then all the scientists jumped on it and, and, and called bullshit. But before yeah. that happened, um, I started thinking, okay, what would evolution look like for essentially cancer? It would be almost Lamarckian, right? Because, and the, and the argument is... The argument, I think, is sound, even if the paper was derided, because Darwinian processes are pretty much ubiquitous. So what's to stop one cell from saying, hey, I'm going to hog all the oxygen, I'm going to haul all the nutrients? You would think, like, the, the question is, why do Darwinian processes that work on an individual level, why do they not also manifest on the level of individual tissues and cells? And, and um, they do. Well, the argument is when they do, it becomes cancer. You have individual cells, right? So I started thinking about the kind of, of evolution that would happen in that case, and it started to look almost Lamarckian to me. You'd almost have these tumors sort of booking it out in real time within a single corpus. And it suddenly occurred to me that what we, what we might have discovered here is a mechanism for John Carpenter's The Thing. <laughs> That's so, so, much. I, exactly. so I basically, so I went from this idea about cancer as, as life. And I wrote a piece of fanfic from the point of view of the thing. Um, and, and it ended up turning into like, first it was just fanfic. And then it was this exploration of this alternative biology. It ended up turning into this weird ass commentary on the missionary impact and impulse and colonialism and so on. I didn't realize I was doing that until halfway through. And it was all of a sudden, holy shit, this thing is like evil and it thinks it's righteous. What? You know, <laughs> he was raised by Baptists. I know what that is. That's a missionary. <laughs> um, but all of this springs not from looking at a viper fish or an angler fish or a brittle star, all of which are very cool and saying, I want to write a story about it, but looking at an idea and saying, what kind of fleshly incarnation would instantiate that idea in an interesting and dramatic way? Well, I'm, I was just about to talk about spadefish toads and, and the parasites, this wonderful worm that moves through the body. And I'm thinking about what a cool story idea would be. And I'm thinking what you're doing is actually already done that. But they actually come in, the spadefoot toad, if you don't know, come out once a year, the rest of the time to mate. The rest of the time they bury themselves and, and wait for the drought to rains to come back. They have a parasite. They almost all have it, a little worm. And it gets on them. It lives in the bladder. And it thrives in that concentrated salty bladder that the drying out toad has. But then when the rains come, the toad flushes all that out, flushes up, but the worms hang on. They're waiting for sex. So once the toad is having sex, then the toads come out, or the worms come out of the toad. Look for another toad. This is the best part, and this is what I thought of you with Peter, is they get in through the lungs. What? Hang in there for three <laughs> weeks, building a bubble fortress around themselves worm their way back up into the mouth, back down into the lungs. Yes, oh, into the digestive system where they're now protected by their bubble sac and go all the way down as fast as they can before they're digested to get back to the bladder where they'll wait another year. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I don't know, but this is much better than Fantastic Journey. This is a fabulous story waiting to be written. <laughs> and, and then so you talk about take it forward. So See, what part of this explicitly this. reminded you of me? Was it the parasites <laughs> living in the, the cloaca of the toad? Or it was, was it the looking... toad itself? <laughs> the worm. Uh, no, it was looking at the at microbiology for inspiration, at the at the cellular level of what's going on in our bodies as we don't we tend to think of our bodies as packages that are, are safe from the outside world, whereas inside there's all kinds of things going on, and you know that. Yeah. Yes. I'll stop now, but thank you for inspiring me, Peter. <laughs> As always. We look forward to reading it. Uh, <laughs> all right. So I have uh I want to give our, our audience a nice long time to ask questions and, and you a nice long time to ask them. So I'm gonna switch over to uh the Discord now and look at some of the questions. So audience, please write your questions. Uh and um okay so i see mob asks don't cancers outgrow their supply though there are creatures simply too big to get meaningful cancers because they starve themselves out 
I think that's interesting. So I was say it would be interesting having a story where you had a kind of an evolved cancer that effectively domesticated and farmed its um, host to keep yeah. it going. Peter likes that one too. <laughs> well, I mean, look look at what happens with epidemiology everywhere. I mean, um, you know, everything from if you have Ebola, right, it kills everybody and then it implodes. The best and that's all good for it. Yeah, the best pathogens, the best parasites are those that do not kill the host. And so what you frequently get is when a, a pathogen encounters a novel population, which is happening all the time as we're cutting down the forests. And I mean, hello, COVID, this is a training wheels plague, basically. But it's one example of things where where a bug gets in contact with a, a, a host that's naive, you immediately get massive virulence. Um, and then acclimation as the more virulent strains get weeded out because they're not as successfully reproducing because they're killing their hosts off too fast. So why wouldn't that? I mean, if cancer is rampant growth, you're going to also expect mutation within that rampant growth. Why wouldn't you have natural selection for benign cancer? I mean, I played around with it in, in one of my books where this a bunch of monks basically um, used certain genes to turn their brains into cancer for various reasons. Um, a kind of a, a weird neural over pruning thing, but beyond the engineering aspect of it, I wonder if natural selection could promote, I mean, the argument about certain animals being too big, maybe if you have a really large animal that gives the cancer a chance to experiment mm -hmm. without killing the host. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if you so had a cancer, would, if you had yeah. a cancer that ha that affected its hosts or any any kind of um, parasite that affected its host metabolism, so that it bred earlier and more often, or or yeah, like I mean, imagine a tumor on a bird. You've got some kind of waterfowl, right? And it's got a tumor that gets interpreted as a sexual selection device, like a peacock's tail or something, right? All of a sudden, this thing makes you sexy. Um, I mean, you know, maybe your, your penis gets cancerous and becomes like eight feet long. And, yeah. and everybody who likes Ken Russell films suddenly finds you incredibly attractive. And you die. You die when you're 18, but you've sired about 25 kids in the meantime. And so that becomes, it becomes almost symbiotic. The thing that kills you also ensures your reproductive fitness. And mutualism is certainly something to consider what, what you know, there's partnerships yeah. that develop. Uh, I'm going to stop now. I'm listening for Casey here. Uh, I was just going to say, if you would like to read something that explores um, the symbiotic relationship between cancer and host and the interesting ways that it can impact not only biology, but culture, um, the Baru Cormorant books by Seth Dickinson have a really intriguing cult based around this premise. And um, I hesitate to go into it in too great a detail because it involves, they don't show up until like a, at least the second, possibly the third book in the series. And so it would take a lot of explanation, but um, yes, if you are, uh, if you are curious to see a, symbi a symbiotic cancer cult culture in action, I uh, hi highly recommend those books. There you go. Huh. Okay, I'm going to ask another question from the audience. Um, Mini Fandom asks favorite fictional species, and I want to hear Julie because she hasn't talked. I missed the last word that you said. Favorite fictional species. Oh, favorite fictional species. Hmm. My own. No, <laughs> that's a terrible question. I went through my own bookshelf and I said to myself, "No, no, I actually like my own best." Um, it's okay to be your own. It's okay to be my own. I guess yeah. like the, the one I like is the one that I developed a great deal of time into simply because it can shape change its molecular structure and use energy to do so in order to be something else. So I could explore the biology of, of literally being inside a different body uh, over and over again. And I found that to be a great way to do uh, do biology. But I think I'll pass on this question and think about it some more. Although I do have some marvelous partiers that are basically flakes of dandruff. Um, and I wasn't thinking of you, Peter. <laughs> Aww. You guys. 
You're mean. Um, well, in that case, I'll ask Adrian. Adrian, what's your favorite species? I'm frantically looking to find. Ah, there we go. To find the name of the wretched things. Um, so the the times from. Oh, they're my favorite. Oh, the those beach. guys. That one in that case. Um, I mean, I've got to say, it's one of those. I'd probably give you a different answer to this each time you ask, bearing on whatever came foremost in my mind. But there are species that live an entirely social existence in that an individual time is a group of five or more of them that are in constant kind of communication with each other. And the personality is built up of those and will change if you add or subtract um, and, and, um, individual units into that sort of um, that functional mass. Um, and that's and, such a great metaphor for team building. But also uh, just purely on, on a purely very, very satisfying Spec Evo world building level the amount of thought of all the things this would feed into as they are you know, because they're sentient they have a society but there's all of the ways they relate to each other as sort of so individual-ish individuals and what is important to them and how they interact and evolve and grow is all based around this this weird feature of how they how they function and it's brilliantly thought out nice those are, those are, if you haven't seen them, audience, they're from Werner Vinge's uh, A Fire Upon the Deep. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I'm going to ask a question from Juliet and Maddie. Mm -hmm. How often do you consider changing the laws of physics to facilitate new alien life? And I'm going to look to see who's raising their hand. Well, changing the laws of physics. Pro or con? Um... I mean, I guess yeah, I try it. not to. Uh, <laughs> it, I mean, also, when, when, I'm, when I'm when I'm working with with sort of actual speculative biology and speculative evolution, it would kind of feel like cheating. I suppose what I do do is just go beyond my specific knowledge range and then don't do the research that would tell me that the thing I'm doing is impossible. <laughs> Just sort of close your eyes to it. <laughs> take Maybe that big step. For that's, since, uh, that's oh, sorry, Julie, what, what were you going to say? I was going to say, just take that big leap. But that is what our, our readers expect. That's what we're doing. We're, we're supposed to be speculating beyond. But for me, if it's not grounded, um, if I don't start with something that I, I feel comfortable with, or, or as Casey mentioned, you know, like an ecology that you can believe in, I, I love the Aspen Force, uh, it doesn't work as well. And and certainly breaking the laws of physics. I mean, no, no, I, I try not to. If I see one that I know I'm breaking, I actually really don't. <laughs> well, Benji's teams kind of break the laws of physics. Yeah, in, in the sense that their their web work is acoustically based. Yeah, and there's a there's a serious limitation to the baud rate that you're going to get from things that are basically sonaring at each other. Um, and they that's, have I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I, I loved the concept of those creatures, but I don't think he interrogated it as thoroughly as he should have because they operated when you, you got past the singles and we got four or five of them. They basically did operate like a single integrated hive mind. There should have been tons of There should have been, yeah, you should have seen, you should have seen almost ruminations where it takes time for a signal to get from one side of the pack to the other, because it's the speed of sound, it's slow. It doesn't carry as much. I mean, one of the reasons dolphins have such big brains, it takes more processing power to deal with, with impoverished acoustic signals than, than um, visual ones. Um, and this isn't, um, this is not something that, that occurs to a lot of people. I, I, think, I think to some extent, there's a reason it's called science fiction. And, 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 and it's, it's, we break the laws sometimes because we don't know any better. Uh, sometimes because we're, we're just not qualified, but other times because you, you got to assume that we don't always know everything. Yes. You've got to assume that with a 21st century science, assuming civilization doesn't collapse in some timeline where we actually get our act together, there will be a 22nd century science. And this is one of the things that problems I have with the mundane science fiction movement is it, it, it says, well, everything has to adhere to what we know about science today. And that implies that 
Nice. We already know everything. And I, I find that a profoundly anti-scientific perspective. So the question is, are we breaking the laws of physics or are we extrapolating into a potentially new area of physics that hasn't been discovered mm -hmm. yet? I think that's an important distinction. It is. And there is nothing, yeah. there is no organism on this planet that we don't know more about now than we knew even last month. Because of the tools <laughs> we have to look at them, because of the, the people who are paying attention to them. I mean, I was uh, I was a teaching animal behavior, and the textbook said that birds that look alike tell which sex is which by bumping into each other until the parts work. No, because you talk about things that are implausible and unreliable, but that is in my, that was in the books we were using. So I just said we don't know how yet, but they certainly know. And it turns out, for the example, birds, chickadees birds. could see UV. And they have markings that tell male from female, and their voices are very, very distinct as well. So, of course, the birds know what they're doing, you know, <laughs> but, but, but the idea that we what? don't know enough, I, I have no patience for that. I'm like, Peter, I, I just think that's ridiculous. You, we will know more, and it's our job to imagine what more we could know. Lovely. Yeah. Um, that's, I was, I was going to say, I, I pretty much, there's nothing yeah. I could add to that other than what Julie said. That's, that's perfect. Yeah. Well, I was thinking since your, your world is a secondary world fantasy, so there's some fantasy involved. There's some different physics. Perhaps what's your, what's your different physics? Uh, basically the, uh, the type of sorcery in the, um, the serial that I wrote that's, you know, cur currently being novelized is literally just straight up Merlin ass sorcery. There is no, uh, science involved. There are characters oh, okay. <laughs> stumbling their way through knowing it, attempting to use their equivalent of scientific methods to figure out how to right. perform it in a more sciencey way but it exists uh, beyond them and outside them. But um, tying, tying back into like the laws of real world physics, when you're writing secondary world fantasy, um, what matters isn't necessarily that you're adhering to the same standards of believability that we have for something set in the real world. What matters is grounding your reader in what the, the rules and expectations of your world are. As long as you can convince your readers that you know what you're doing and that you have a solid foundation for your work and that you aren't going to break the rules. I mean, personally, as a reader, I will follow a, an author who seems like they know what they're talking about pretty much anywhere. People, people want to be taken for the ride. People are reading your story because they want to suspend their disbelief and they want to enjoy it. So don't be afraid to get a little wacky, especially if you are uh, writing something set in a completely secondary world. Just stay consistent to your own internal logic and uh, have your characters react in a way that is consistent with the world in which they have been raised and the beliefs that they have, even if those characters all have different beliefs, because, uh, yeah, everyone is here to have a good time. And whether you are writing the hardest science fiction or the, uh, like, broadest strokes speculative fantasy, um, you're, you're writing it to entertain other people and yourself. And the people who are wanting to read it are wanting to read it to be entertained. So don't be afraid to start with, hey, this is a really fun idea. I want to see if I can write it. And then extrapolate backwards to see what real world concepts you can draw on to make the cool fun thing happen. Yeah, I agree totally. Um, okay, so we have we have five minutes, and I want to give us a chance to talk about what uh, what what we have that's coming out soon. I think I'll tie that in to this last question. Uh, so here goes the question's from Kira, and it says, "If you're not quite so familiar with how research biology or speculative biology works, what resources would you recommend to get started with?" in terms and processes that you could use to springboard to more. So in other words, research recommendations, and, uh, and then we can talk about our own work as well. Like research on the research, like, like research on how to do research? I think uh, that's a good question. Yeah, do well, that. Well, that's that right? too, yes, yes. <laughs> Well, there's, I mean, you know, 20, 30 years ago, people would have said Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions. These days, I think it's uh, science as a process, but I forgot who wrote that because it turned out that structure of scientific revolutions really didn't have the, the true story. Um, yeah. 
I didn't like it. <laughs> I mean, it was okay. I liked it, but but apparently, you know, once it came out, people tested it and found it wanting. Um, so Where science is? as a process. Process science is the, as a process. I that I've guy gotten the damn name of the author, and then there's popular do- stuff. But this is all pretty dry, right? I mean, uh, it, it's it's not it's not a fun read. It's the kind of thing to do if you're actually studying for your comps and a PhD. Um, I would I would characterize most research in an academic setting as just pure Darwinianism. Like you've got you've got the 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 grad student is going to get shot on by a particular professor because your supervisor offended the professor like five years ago at the Houston conference. Um, a lot of this, I mean, the way science works is basically you can't get rid of human bias. So what you have is competing biases that bash each over the head and whatever's standing when the dust clears is the next generation's model. Oh, Kindly Inquisitors by David Rausch. It's a short I'm book. It's it's um, and it's not even about. It came out originally in the early nineties. It's it's about what they call political correctness. It's about it's about uh, thought control and and how the kindly left tends to do. But so so it's not really about scientific research. But it is a very good um, it, it, the setup, the introduction of that book is a very good setup of how research uh, works. The idea of of not being able to eliminate hu- by, you know humanity from the humans doing the science, yeah. and and why we have this system that of uh, sort of adversarial science that's the best thing we can come up with. Um, I'll wait till he gets to the end of the sentence. What do you want to say, Julie? Well, I was going to say back to the question. <laughs> Which I loved everything you said. Um, I'm currently working on a new science fiction in which I am developing um, a planet that has uh, biologies at two different times in their evolutionary path. So as part Mm. of this, uh, I am also spending a lot of time doing natural history research in just what you find when you go outside in the winter. Um, what you find and kind of strategies, small things use, um, those little details, like, like as Casey mentioned, the, the aspens and things like this, to me, they add a lot of richness when I'm developing a world. So if I'm going to have some kind of colonial uh, organisms, what kind of, of uh, shelters will they make? What kind of size can I go with uh, to make the world as real as I can before I toss in the more speculative elements to it? So. That's the kind of research I'm doing right now. That and um, uh, the, the Parasite Rex, which I was re- reading from before, which if you haven't read it yet, it's just it's a wonderful book. Enjoy. I give it to you with all, <laughs> all good, happy happy thoughts. The man's hilarious. Um, and, and books like that I look for. So that, that's, that's what's coming from me and what I suggest. That, there's a really good um, general purpose book very quickly called Evolving the Alien or alternatively, What Would an Extraterrestrial Look Like by uh, Stuart and Cohen. Which is my kind of, which is a really good look at how to think about how aliens might evolve and what they might look like, which is a really nice, broad ranging um, book on the topic. Thank you. Uh, Casey? Uh, I actually have a really short and sweet answer for this one. Anytime I want to research a brand new topic that I know nothing about, I just find a nonfiction book about it that I like and then I read it, and then I just go straight to the bibliography and tear that up. Uh, bibliographies Lovely. are your friend. Sources are your friend, because uh, this person has already gone through the trouble of collating all those other sources for you. And so um, just just piggyback off their hard work. Brilliant. Yes. I'm sorry, I we have only one minute left, but can you please tell us where we can find the next thing of yours that's coming out? And I'll start with Peter. Peter, what's your next book? Oh, most uh, recently published. Most Jesus. Oh, what is my most recently published? It's not being published. Um, it was commissioned by somebody, and then the publishers refused to publish it for reasons that I won't go into because there's NDAs involved. Um, I'm working on a bunch Sorry. of little things now. The closest thing you're going to get probably is there's a screenplay for Blindsight doing the rounds now. Apparently, 
um, but all my other stuff is is small. The, the novels are are working on. I'm working on two novels, but they're that's long term stuff. Anything that's coming out this year is going to be short and sweet, and and I don't actually even know where they're appearing yet. So, sorry. Um, I think we might have to go into the chat. Unfortunately, thank that you. That comes Spectrum. out next week. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized I had it here. Adrian. Adrian. Oh, I thought we were going to chat. I've, I've got to, I've got to read now. I'm going to scoot for, so. Okay. I want it. I want it. I want it. The doors are open, everyone. Read the doors Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Also, yes. Thank you for joining me in the chat. We'll be there. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Dan. Bye. How do I get out of this? How the hell?